Hello and welcome to Take Time. I'm your host, Patrick Marlad. Today's episode of Cocktail Time was filmed at the Brooklyn Watch Shop, home to the Carpenter Watch and J Watch Repair. If you're in the neighborhood and need a repair, want to purchase a vintage watch or new accessory, or take in a Carpenter Watch, drop by the Brooklyn Watch Shop off Vanderbilt in Brooklyn, New York. Today we'll be speaking with James Reeves, a local New Yorker, consultant in corporate social responsibility, and designer and owner of Diefendorf Watches. And what drink is more fitting for a New Yorker than a classic Manhattan? For this drink, we'll need rye or bourbon, sweet vermouth, and Angostura bitters. We'll start by chilling our serving glass, and we'll do so by placing a few ice cubes inside of our glass. Of course, I'm making a drink for James and myself. My glass is off to the side. Next, let's fill up our shaker glass with some of those same ice cubes. I'm gonna go ahead and drop in a few now. I'm gonna go ahead and stir this cocktail. You can shake it, of course, but stirring is preferable. We'll top this up with two parts rye, one part sweet vermouth, and two healthy dashes of Angostura bitters. Once it's prepped, we'll go ahead and give it a very thorough stir. I would say about 20 to 25 seconds of stirring will do. And after our cocktail is thoroughly stirred, we can go ahead and take the ice out of our serving glass. With that, we're ready to go ahead and strain our cocktail into our serving glass using the top end of our Boston shaker, making sure the ice cubes don't fall in. And just like that, we have a classic Manhattan. Now you can go ahead and garnish this with maraschino cherries, or in this instance, a freshly sliced orange peel. Manhattans, classic. I rarely ever make them. How is it? Very good. I always make them. So, hmm. how'd you grade it? I'd say it's pretty good. A A minus. Yeah. A minus. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm flattered. Uh, so hi, hi James. James Reeves. This is James Reeves of Diefendorf, a new watch brand. Four models in front of us, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about these watches today. Obviously, and that's actually the first thing I want to talk about. Yeah. Um, so this is sort of your personal and private collection. You design and wear your own watches, and these are really lovely. Thank you. Um, so, if you would like, we can talk about some of these to start. Sure thing. Yeah. So, I guess the most important part of a watch is the movement. So, mm -hmm. we have a Swiss-made movement, a Salita SW200. For each of our four models, um, they have the same case design. And we'll go into the brand history in a little bit and the brand inspiration, but one yes, of the I things like that's pretty important yeah. sort of for the brand. It's kind of integral to this model in particular, at least. But yeah, yeah. It's one of my other hobbies in addition to watch designing is, is ancestry research. And I was doing uh, uh, ancestry research one time and came across the story of my sixth great-grandfather, mm. uh, who, and this was just on Ancestry.com, and, sure. um, you know, you get those green leaves that come up and uh, saw that the day he died was my birthday, just 200 years prior. And it was the kind of thing where I like rubbed my eyes and I just could not believe what I was seeing. Yeah, yeah. And um, so through some, some additional documents came across, it turns out he was in an ambush in upstate New York, uh, which was the Wild Wild West at the time. Uh, he's the son of Swiss immigrants, mm -hmm. uh, and he served as a captain in the militia for um, during the American Revolution, fighting on the American side. Uh, and so his name was Captain Henry Diefendorf, and right about the same time is when I was really getting into designing and into watches, uh, and thought, well, gosh, if I'm going to start a watch company, there's no better name to call it. On the case itself, there are 17 big lines and 76 small lines, which is what makes it the 1776 um, case and bezel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and just as an homage to the American Revolution. Uh, and we'll have um, four different dial types. So there's the carbon fiber, mm -hmm. uh, and then three sun rays. Uh, so green, kind of like a, a charcoal brown, um, and then a, 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 a blue sun ray. Because I, I just love the sun rays. I love how it captures the light and, sure. and how it reflects back. And then the carbon fiber was just kind of like a design experiment when we were working on it. This is actual, no, I'm, I might be a little naive to this. Is this an actual carbon fiber dial? It's actual, not a pattern to look like carbon fiber. Yeah, it's actual woven, um, physically woven carbon fiber. Uh, it's not even applied onto you know a metal backboard. It's actually just straight up carbon really? fiber. Well, wow, that's lovely. Because, you know, 
carbon fiber they make bicycles out of and stuff. It's a yeah, really yeah, strong yeah. material. So it should be resilient. At yeah. least as a watch face. I exactly. can imagine that seems pretty practical a choice. Yeah, yeah. The the cool thing that's really different about the um, the carbon fiber one versus the sun rays sure. is just because it is a three dimensional material with um, you look at some of the 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 way the logo appears, the way the the name in seventeen seventy six appears, it creates a three dimensional element to it. Mm-hmm. That is really neat. Um, yeah, because that, those surfaces are so flat, it, it does pop and yeah. come to life. Yeah. The yeah. Diefendorf logo and text, really. Yeah. At Carbon Fiber, I'm not going to lie, I uh, I was looking over the catalog online before obviously seeing these in person, and you never really know what to make of a watch in picture, and to be honest, the Carbon Fiber didn't look that, that good to me. I never really under, understood the look of Carbon Fiber. It looks fantastic in person. Yep. Honestly, yep. probably... My favorite of the lot. If I'm gonna, if uh, I'm just gonna go out and say it. Yeah, it looks really good. I've never seen a carbon fiber dial, not that I can recollect. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's a very unique choice. Yeah. Why, why carbon fiber again? You just I, we were we my my business partners and I when we were working on it, on the design we were just experimenting. You know, we basically the blue one is the one I had in mind when I created the watch, yeah. and I knew yeah. I wanted different sunray dials. Chris, my the guy I work with, was like, "Oh, I've got this sunray dial or this uh, carbon fiber dial," so I just pulled it out. Uh, in in put it into the the CAD drawings and I was just like oh that's really cool so I don't mind that yeah I don't mind that at all so it was just a, a little something special and um, I think it's just it was the kind of thing when I saw it I'm like I have to have that <laughs> yeah 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 that's crazy it's yeah. so serendipitous too that he would just think to add that to the mix and mm-hmm. there's something unique about the bezel too I, am I mistaken this is patented in design yes yeah we filed for a design patent so. True to government form, we will find out in 18 to 36 months sure. if we get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the bezel itself is really handsome, though, and there's a lot of detailing that you don't, again, notice in picture, and it's a shame. And it's one of the luxuries, I guess, of reviewing watches or getting to see them in person is the fact that you can make out a lot of the finer details. But I love, I guess you call it fluting on the side. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is a really handsome look for this watch. It looks vented. Yeah, thanks, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that was, you know, when I was considering starting the, the business, one of the things I, my own criteria is that I just didn't want to create another dive watch or just another, you know... Field watch, I guess, in this yeah, instance. Yeah, what I basically yeah. call, like, uh, Alibaba watches. Just so I know, and just so the audience knows, what, Alibaba.com? What What are you referencing? What is this? <laughs> so, yeah. There's a resource we could just make. You can be a watchmaker, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to put a link in the description. Yeah, Alibaba is basically like the um, Amazon of China. Okay. And so they have, um, you can go on to Alibaba dot com now and and find suppliers for um you know children's toys or oh. kid pools or um you know even car parts and sure. things like that um and they have you know a lot of the watch factories there are, are up there so um so i don't recommend it because the key thing about going into business is what makes you different mm. and if you just go with an existing design you have not made your stamp on this world and uh, you know that's one of the things that we want to avoid doing. Yeah, and that's a shame because you see that more and more often. Like, there's a lot of brands that come and go, and uh, these things become undesirable. But you see a lot of the same trends between case model to case model, dial design to dial design. I feel mm-hmm. like Bauhaus designs are in like simplistic stick dials with slim line cases that dressy look that sort of dw is perfected and Mm. i see so many of those get churned out so it's nice to get a micro brand that is trying something different and you guys always ask me why don't i review brands i like or why don't i review brands i don't like because i often put down brands i don't like because you guys don't see all the brands i decide not to look at on the show because there are a lot of brands that are very similar to one another i guess you'd call them alibaba watches (laughs) and uh, i have to say no to a lot of brands and it's great when you get to see something that is unique in design and i that's what i like most about you know horology is the design aspect how does it make you feel when you wear it um, and these are unique in their case design, but not only that, their dials look really, really lovely. Very saturated, like rich colors you're going with. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good for a first range, and I don't know if you intentionally made it bold because of your great great grandfather. His time in the service, so something like that. I think part of one of the reasons that I went with very bold colors was in some of my just home decor design. You know, I'm not, definitely not an interior designer, but. I just really like colors that when you look at it, you know what it is. Like, yeah. you know what color it's meant to be. Not this, like, in-between, you know, taupe or 
um, you know, you know, palette that you might see on the Golden Girls or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I like bold colors because if you're gonna make a statement, you know, make it. Um, it doesn't mean that the entire room needs to be yeah. like fuchsia or something like that. Um, certainly, you know, accent colors are are a great thing to do. But um, you know, at least for this first collection, I wanted to have something that, like, when you looked at it, you knew that it was a green watch. You knew it was a blue watch. The rotor, I wanted to do something special. Um, a to just kind of reflect back the red that you see in the logo on the front. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, the same red tone, I'm assuming. Yeah, right? same red it tone. Um, also, to really kind of draw a statement that this really is a Swiss-made movement, and you know, one of the things about the brands of the inspiration with Henry Diefendorf is, of course, he was fighting for the American cause, but he's the son of Swiss immigrants. And so I wanted to do the very best that I could to prioritize American suppliers and the Americanness of the watch. We can sure. talk about that in a bit. Americanness. But also, yeah, like have a Swiss made movement in it yeah. um, to reflect his heritage. And so I wanted to draw attention to that. So that's why we did the rotor in red um, and uh, to highlight, you know, Swiss made as well as the the jewels, um, but also just it's something really cool to look at, and I didn't want to do an open case back and then not make a statement with the rotor, and you, you, yeah. you know, don't really notice it. This just kind of draws your attention to it. But speaking of Americanness, yeah, as you put it, um, how do you mean? Well, um, you know, I, in an ideal world, um, it would have been great to to have everything made in the U.S. and be able to, other than the movement, say that it's a it's an American-made watch, but yeah. you just just can't yeah um, just yeah. that's not the way things are right now um, you know some things are changing with more, more people coming on board but really the reality is is all the machines are in Switzerland or Hong Kong or China um, and so meaning for like the cases and things like that sure sure so you know with the brand inspiration being this like connection between America and, Sw and Switzerland I you know brought the movement in um, but did the best I could to make um, to support American watchmaking. Um, so made some strategic choices that cost more, um, but things like having it assembled in the U.S. Yeah, um, yeah. Final assembly in the U.S. to support American watchmakers. The leather straps, those are made in the U.S. It would have been much cheaper for me to go overseas, um, but again, the idea is to um, not only buy a watch because of its design, but also what it stands for and. Uh, you know, I, I look forward to kind of over time in the oncoming years to be able to find ways to bring more Americanness to the watches. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, as a brand new brand uh, who is bootstrapping the whole thing, you know, it's it's uh, without having millions of dollars myself to invest in new machines yeah, yeah. and things like that. This is a really good start, but it's only the start, and I'm really excited for the next couple of years and the next couple of designs to see what we can do about that. With all of the heavy military tie-ins, um, from obviously the name of the brand Diefendorf to not only that the logo, but the case design here, um, not to pigeonhole you into one design type, but is military the kind of theme you're going to be going with with future designs? Is that something that's important to you with your next model? Not to say you have one on the road um, in the roadworks, or I know anything about that. Mm -hmm. um, but is that something you're going to try to continue with the brand that's sort of military design language or no? That's a great question. Um, I'd say um, two things. So first, um, my primary mission in starting this, in addition to, to just kind of really wanting to get a great watch out there in the world, sure. and it's something I truly believe in. One of the things that's really motivating me is to just try to find a way to make Henry Diefendorf's name live on because it's just, you know, that's a very personal motivation. No one else even has to like understand that or get that, uh, but that's just something that's really important to me. Um, so as, if I'm doing a good job in creating great watches, I've achieved kind of like that that first goal. Uh, the second kind of goal is actually the mission statement of our company, and that's to rebel against the usual. So I think what often um, happens is in in design is that you do get pigeonholed, you do get identified with a certain design, um, and you know. I, and so that's not what I want to do. Um, our next couple of designs actually um, don't have any connection to the American Revolution. Mm. They don't have any connection to the military. They don't have any connection to, you know, field watches per se as a category. Um, but what they do do is that um, they are fitting into something that I found that motivated me to, to even pick up a pencil and paper in the first place is that they are truly distinct watches. 
but familiar enough that you would still want to wear them. When I was starting to look into watches, I, I wanted to go out and buy something, but I found a lot of them were looking very similar. And the ones that were dissimilar were just so far out there and crazy looking that yeah. I would never even want to wear them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I found that there was nothing in between. There was, there was nothing that was just a little bit, like, maybe um, courageous enough to, like, be very distinct um, and, and without just going way over the top. And so, you know, our next couple of designs are, you know, have something that's very unique about them. I may not, you know, get a design pattern on each one of them, but yeah, like, yeah. it's at least you look at it and there's a part of it where you're like, I've never seen that before. And so I think that's kind of like our mission. Um, it's not necessarily to be a military brand or a patriotic brand. It's to be a brand that stands for truly distinctive watches. Oh, good. And beyond, obviously, Henry Diefendorf, um, why watches? Why was watch, watches the thing you decided to move into? Because it's very far from your uh, previous and uh, somewhat current occupation. Why, yeah, why, why watches and why now? I was a bit crazy to kind of start working on it when I was just because of the way the marketplace was with Swiss watches. You know, a couple of years ago, it was, it was a really bad kind of economic indicators in terms of the watch industry. But, um, now's the time. <laughs> now's the time. No, Attack. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> that's the good thing about having a year delay is that now finally, you know, the month I'm about to launch, the Swiss watch industry finally had their best month in, in August. So that was good. Yeah. best month in a while anyway. Strategic plan? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or luck. Or luck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll say the first one. Yeah, yeah. It's strategic. Yeah, it's strategic yeah. luck. Um, but yeah, I guess to answer your question in terms of why watches, you know, a couple of reasons. One is... is just from a personal level, I've always felt a watch is like that final statement a guy can make. There's one story that really stood out to me is, is I was just in an airport bar and waiting for my flight and just struck up the conversation with the guy next to me. I was like, oh, tell me about your watch. And uh, so, he, you know, it's telling me that basically his husband got it for him as a wedding gift. And as he was telling me this, he started to get choked up because just the emotion of just how much the watch meant to him you know, made him that emotional. And that's when I realized that, you know, watches are a lot more than a way to tell time. We all have more accurate, you know, ways of telling time in our, our cell phones than watches or <laughs> our smart watches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's not about necessarily accurately tell, telling time. It stands for something more. It stands for uh, your aspirations. It stands for your, your design aesthetic. It stands for what mood you're in that day um, and as a as a as a guy like there's very few ways you can accessorize it reminds me I, I used to when I lived in Chicago I had a motorcycle and everyone loves to like customize their motorcycles sure. and so that because their motorcycle is an expression of themselves and I feel like watches are a daily way to make a guy do that to himself of just like I'm in this kind of mood today and yeah. I'm gonna wear this watch or... and in some cases just as expensive yeah as motorcycles. <laughs> that's true um, but yeah. before all of this before watches you were doing something entirely different yeah in my opinion uh, which was if you'd like to share yeah I mean for my entire career I've been specializing in corporate social responsibility sure. uh, corporate sustainability has umpteen names but the core idea is that um, to help particularly big businesses do business in a way that is profitable, but also good for people and the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, it, was, it is a great career. And, um, but eventually I kind of hit a, a, a wall, so to speak, where it's like my entire career and all my education and degrees and skills were consistently being summed up in PowerPoint presentations. And as great as it is to like create a PowerPoint that has amazing animations that work, um, and- Because oftentimes they don't. Because oftentimes they don't. And, like, and then now, of course, now everyone just prints out the decks and yeah. doesn't even project them. And, uh, and I just felt like, you know, I have something more to say and, and do, and, and I'm tired of talking about the theory of business and I just want to do business. And, um, and, and at the same time, I, I am not ready to leave this career of, of sustainability, corporate social responsibility, and I wanted to reflect that in this new chapter. Uh, and so, you know, I've, I've brought that into Diefendorf, the company, and, and it has no necessarily connection to Henry Diefendorf, but things like, actually, this is 
nobody actually knows about this yet, but we just got our certification for being a carbon neutral company. So we've offset all the carbon emissions from our first year of business, and we'll continue to do that year after year. We also have a embedded corporate giving program. We've made a public commitment to give 10% of our profits back to charity. You know, like many things about this brand, this is just the start of it all. There are a lot of other tools and 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 in the corporate social responsibility toolbox that I'm hoping to be able to pull out once um, you know I get further more up and running. But mm-hmm. um, you know, at, at a minimum, a way to start out is is it's pretty cool to to be a carbon neutral company and uh, and then also make a, a social commitment as well right away. So speaking of your previous work experience, um, I know you've worked with a lot of larger brands um, that we all recognize uh, before obviously shifting gears and, and starting to work in your own field here with these watches. Um, do you want to talk about that as it pertains to your previous work well? Yeah, I, I think you know going back to my first job in college, um, I, you know, out of college, I should say. Yeah. You know, it's uh, managing college, <laughs> working for these brands. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that'd be nice. I think it, I think what it came down to is just that I have kind of like two fundamental beliefs about myself that um, motivate me to this day. Not only with this watch company, but have motivated me for the past right. years. Sure. Um, but that's one that I was meant to be on this earth and leave it better than when I found it. And the second is that I happen to believe, but also I've noticed through my you know couple decades experience in work that capitalism is the fastest way to do that. Um, I worked in nonprofit roles. I worked lobbying the U.S. government, um, and I just have found you can make a much quicker difference um, in business than you can through nonprofit, civil society sector, and then hmm. through government. Um, and I know through through my work that I have made a dent in this world to make it a better place. And, you know, one of the cool examples I think is, um, you know, I was a consultant uh, on uh, back when I lived in Chicago and, and I helped uh, McDonald's put together their global sustainability program. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of the very few global platforms that the company has. Everyone thinks of McDonald's as like this command and control kind of company where in, at that time, Oak Brook, Illinois, there's like a button that they can make you know, decisions that happen in Brazil. Um, huh. But they actually have very few global programs, uh, one of which is now sustainability. But before that, it was like the World Cup, the Olympics, and a couple of movies a year. Sure. It's the only thing they do globally that, you know, everyone has to activate everywhere. Uh, sustainability is now one of them. The interesting thing is, is as a small company, it's very easy to make decisions about how we're going to act, what we're going to do, um, decisions we're going to make, um, investments we're going to make, uh, but when you are a big company in modern America and in, in, in the global world now, and but you've been in existence for several decades, you have to make tough choices. Hmm. And when your customers are used to demanding certain things, and this is outside of McDonald's, just big companies in general, um, as somebody who's kind of like that entrepreneur inside a big company, trying to make a big difference for uh, workers, for the environment, it becomes about like how do you create that change in, in just a way that is a slight nudge that can eventually get you towards your long-term goal sure. of whether it be everyone earning a fair wage, whether it be carbon neutrality, whether it just be less waste, um, whether it be more composting or healthier food or products that you know are made with good ingredients. Um, I can imagine that was probably difficult with McDonald's because their menu is different globally. Yeah, you yeah. Know what I mean, so it's different globally, and um, but also some of it goes back to consumer demand. It's like mm-hmm. the fact of the matter is, is America we want loves the their burgers. We they want, want their McRib. <laughs> yeah. They want their fries with their McRib. Yeah. And so then you know what do you do? I mean, salads at McDonald's. Um, that's new. That's new. We and, have them now. Yeah, we have them, and um, but I. I challenge you, anybody out there, I doubt anybody's like, I want to sell today, I'm going to McDonald's. That's true. And so, um, so yeah, it, it's just really interesting because some companies want to go somewhere farther, more progressive, whatever you want to call it, but their consumers aren't there yet. And so what do you do? And so that's, that's what's a fascinating puzzle to figure out is how do you start to change a company and when when consumers are a little bit farther behind um, but you know where you want to go in terms of making a better 
uh, imprint on people on the planet without sacrificing profit, but it it's going to take a long time to get there. And that's that's where the creativity comes in, that's where the strategy comes in, where the research comes in, and the marketing too. It's That's what was really interesting about that career. Yeah, and then to tie back to watches, I mean, the reality is it's also watch consumers are not looking for a socially or environmentally responsible watch company. Mm, um, that's interesting. Well, I mean, some may be more conscious, but I don't think it's part of their... It's a deciding factor in whether right. you purchase a watch or not. I think you guys are more concerned, or at least probably like I am, what movement's in there. Is it stainless yeah. steel? Is it plated? Exactly. Is it mineral crystal? Is it sapphire? Yeah. Not necessarily how it's sourced, how it's produced. Exactly. What kind of footprints that work leaves behind. Yeah. And so that's why all of our work on social responsibility, environmental responsibility, it's not going to be a lead message, but it's going to be there if you're interested in it. Mm-hmm. And at the bottom of the page, <laughs> asterisks, yeah, yeah, small we'll, print. We'll we'll have our own, you know, details on it. And we've had a couple blog posts that I've made, clarified some of our public commitments and things like that. It's always there for anybody to read up on. But the reality is, everybody buys a watch because a they like it, b it's in their price range, c it's a quality they can expect, and ultimately they think they look sexy wearing it. So, <laughs> you know, those are the main reasons. Everything else after that is. Uh, just a, another way of engaging with your potential customers. It's another way, another conversation to have about the watches. On, on that note, because you mentioned a portion of each uh, watch sale, a portion of those proceeds will go towards a charity. Are there charities in mind that you are putting that 10% towards? Um, is it publicly known? Uh, it's not publicly known, but I can reveal it now. <laughs> sure. I'd like to. I mean, I'm I'm interested to see so, what you guys stand for. So. Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, again, just taking a little bit of inspiration from American Revolution, trying not to overdo it too much. But I was a corporate philanthropist, if that is the title, for several years. Um, I had a budget every year when I worked for a big company, and I was responsible for giving it out uh, to charities. That was a great job for me. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, it was a tough job because you were saying no 99% of the time to everybody who wants money. But um, going back to the brand inspiration of the idea of independence and democracy um, and not having one person decide where money goes to, we're actually going to have our customers choose a charity of their choice. You know, with some restrictions, that's got to be non-political and non-religious. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but what we're creating the systems now to be able to make it possible for our cons- customers um, likely selected at like random drawings in the beginning, um, but to then be able to direct a charity that they care about, whether it's a big charity like World Wildlife Funds or American Heart Association, mm-hmm. American Cancer Society, or you know a local food kitchen, yeah. or or you know LGBTQ organization in their their community. So that's one of the things I'm excited for. Um, and uh, you know, I'd say it's going to be on our blog once we finally have some of the details about that out there. But um, I think it's a little bit of a different take to again rebel against the usual. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rather than me decide I'm donating it to charity X, it's one more reason for me to have a conversation with my customers. Yeah, and that provides consumers an opportunity to step forward and feel like they're giving back as well. Obviously, with that portion. And what's interesting is I. Can I consume a lot. I buy a lot of watches. I kind of have to because I want to share those experiences with you guys. And I'm fortunate enough when things are lent or given to the channel. But you do begin to develop a little bit of consumer guilt. I know I do. Um, whether it's on a personal level, like, oh, this watch could have been a really nice date for me and the girlfriend. Or, <laughs> or it's just I've spent entirely too much. And it does begin to bog you down. It, 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 it is a little upsetting when you think about how grossly we spend money without really giving anything back. Yeah. And it's nice to see that. And I thought that was really interesting when I was overviewing the site. I, not a lot of groups do that that I'm conscious of, at least watch brands. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially upstart ones. So yeah, that's good. Well, yeah, and that's that's so. There's a couple things I love about this brand. One is obviously their roots in American history, but I'm also trying to make it a very modern company. So for our final segment, I love to pick the brains of our guests to see, uh, or rather, learn more about the industry. Um, and as we were mentioning earlier, all these Alibaba brands pop. I like that. So I'm going to use that <laughs> term a lot. All these brands Trade pop up. Yeah, they, they pop up left and right. And um, I love to hear more of the story for these these brands. How 
did you come to be? Because we, we see these new companies come out every single year. And Notice is a great new brand. They've been out for a little while. And Haleos. Uh, but it intrigues me to know and see all these brands, like blogs are lit up discussing all the new watches that come out, but not necessarily their journey. Um, so I'd love to find out from you, like the do's, the don'ts um, in starting a brand, mm -hmm. um, the route you took as opposed to maybe someone else. And there's no wrong way to go about um, creating, but I'd love to hear how you did it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it was a long kind of journey. I think, um, you know, it's, we were talking a little bit before of getting the production watches in, it's going to be about 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and it came in several different kind of phases, but... Um, 18 months from when you had the initial idea for Diefendorf yeah, yeah. to finally getting your production models in hand. And that yeah. actually seems pretty short, a time frame. It, it, looking back, it does, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, all throughout, it's just like, oh gosh, like another delay or another you know this is happening or that is happening but um you know i'd say you know and some of it was was some time that was just researching uh, putting together a business plan understanding who the competitors were how saturated the market was and um, doing all that nerdy business school stuff um but you know the first part of it was um just coming up with a design of and that just was a mm -hmm. lot of tinkering around. There was a lot of just alone time with me, a pencil and a piece of paper. Eventually got into a moleskin book so I didn't lose all those pieces of paper. Um, and Plus, moleskin. The book, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Not and, a sponsor. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think regardless of for the industry or just if anybody interested in entrepreneurship, the key thing for me, the key do, is that you have to have something unique and something that um, will answer the question of why should someone buy your watch. What makes us unique is our design and our approach to business. So we see that through a number of ways, but um, you know, you, you can't see this design anywhere else. And that's what makes a lot of those successful micro brand companies successful is because they have a design aesthetic, they have a statement that they're trying to make and that they're sticking to it. And they're not just going out and buying off the shelf parts and slapping a logo on it. Um, and that's very commonplace and easy to do, but the companies that are built for success are making the hard choices to do mm -hmm. something different, doing it with intent. And you know, there are a lot of other choices that I made along the way. So, you know, Kickstarter is a great example. Um, you did, you didn't. Did not, no, I, mm -hmm. we, we actually, you know, did not do a Kickstarter um, in part. First of all, let me say Kickstarter is a great platform. Uh, it helps many, many entrepreneurs, as well as many artists, um, creators. I fully believe in the power of Kickstarter. Um, I decided that it just was not right for us for a variety of reasons. Um, one, I still have friends who are still waiting on their Kickstarter watches, you know, 14 months later, um, sometimes even two years later. And they get occasional updates, and it, creates, it can create a very bad customer experience if your operations are not worked out, and when it's your first watch they're not going to be worked out and I did not want to create a bad customer experience for anybody who ponied up X number of dollars for a Diefendorf watch um, also if you look at it kind of strategically within Kickstarter right now there's just so many you know watch yeah. companies that are out there yeah. some of them are really great many of them are not and I did not want to have some of that association with this brand of the companies that are out there to just kind of create a quick buck i did not want to be in that pool so yeah I deliberately did not do a kickstarter we'll see if it was a good strategic choice or not i think it was part of what's interesting about this business is customer service and that kind of gets lost in design that kind of gets lost in in the idea and the brand story but ultimately that's why you exist is because you're there yeah. to serve a customer. I can see that being a double-edged sword. Yeah. It is interesting. And I've gone on many Kickstarter campaigns, uh, not necessarily for watches, but that downtime, that period of wait, when someone's figuring out their business, and it's not necessarily their fault for not having it pieced together, but your expectations are elevated when you get nearer and nearer that closing day. Yeah. And then after that, when you wait X amount of months over the expected shipping period. And I can see that ruining the experience and that word of mouth is damning sometimes. Yeah. So I can understand why you would 
be against that. One of the priorities for me when I started this is I wanted to deliver a good product um, to people and uh, and I wanted there to be no doubt about the sincerity and the quality of the product. Hmm. And for me, the decision to not to do a Kickstarter at that time, you know, it would have been about 10 months ago. Um, it, I don't think it was the right call. I think if it was two, three, five years ago, absolutely it would have been the right call. Mm. Um, I have no idea what it's going to be like six months from now, but I think watch companies starting on Kickstarter, um, it's right now is, a, is an uphill battle. and So it's a potential do. It's a potential do. Um, a personal don't. Yeah, personal don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. That's a good way to think. But what are some personal do's that you think would be good for someone who's a uh, young op- entrepreneur, someone who's looking to start a business for themselves? Uh, with the choices you made here, what do you think would, was the best one for this brand? Yeah, I think what's particularly interesting with like kind of like an eighteen month lead time for a good number of those eighteen months, um, let's say it was like fifteen of those months, it was hurry up and wait. And, you know, they have certain milestones that you want to hit of either the prototype models or the CAD drawings or, you know, lining up all the suppliers. Um, it was a lot of hurry up and wait. And one thing that I worked on very uh, purposefully is when I had that downtime working on things like my website, on my blog, and on learning, um, you know, SEO, and search engine optimization. Uh, and learning um, social media advertising. That's something to do is strategically look at your time. Uh, Second thing is um, at a certain point, you kind of have to put the business plan down and just do. Um, There's analysis paralysis. So, you know, I love Excel, Microsoft Excel. I love numbers, um, but I also love creativity. But at a certain point, you have your plan. Yes, you have to execute on it, but you have to throw it behind you too and just get out there go out there and meet people i remember for example one time it was it was something that just still right now obviously brought a huge smile on my face but like it's kind of scary to like go to a cocktail party for and for you know professional reasons or personal you know you know friendships and people ask you know meet random people and they're like oh what do you do and i'm like the first time i said well I'm, i actually own a watch company it was just so cool it's such a cool experience because it's it's finally it's like that that it's something clicks for me personally on that <laughs> level that was just really cool and so you don't necessarily even have to be incorporated to do that by the way if you're considering starting your own you know company if you're considering becoming an interior designer on your own and freelancing or whatever you can just create your own title and try that hat on and see what it feels like and if it gives you that energy and it fills you with motivation, that's something to just kind of explore it a little bit more. I think that was just one thing that was that was neat is that was, I, I described myself as a as owning a watch company before I even incorporated, before the design was even finalized. I just did it as, as for fun at a party just to see. Intentionally? Or intentionally, okay. just to okay. see what it would feel like. But maybe it slipped down. No, no, no. Just in, in just, and also to see what other people's reactions were. And, uh, and it was it, awful. They hated it. <laughs> walked away. <laughs> no. Watches. And, well, that's the cool thing is everyone's reaction. Everyone's reaction was like, watches? Like, really? Like, yeah. like they there's a market for that? Yeah, there's a market for that. Like, and, they, mm-hmm. and, and some people can't believe it this day and age. And then some people think it's like the coolest thing ever. I think there's something about, regardless of like politics or whatever, there's something about our culture, you know, not just in New York, because I've lived all around the country here. People like triers, people like doers, not even necessarily like a Steve Jobs a visionary, but somebody who wants to create something unique and different. And people want to support that, even if it's just with a, a nice smile and a pat on the back. Um, or Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it turns into buying watches yeah, too. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, that's that's a fun thing is, is always, I think the key takeaway just to wrap this whole idea up is always experiment, 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 iterate, whether it's with a design, whether it's with a PowerPoint presentation, whether it's going to a cocktail party and throwing away your old business card and saying whatever it is that you're dreaming of and you're scared of and just saying that's what you do just to see what it feels like. Hmm. And if, if that fills you with motivation as opposed to fear and dread, try it out some more.
So guys, that will do it for today's cocktail time. I'm likely to make another Manhattan after this. I mean, I did buy all of that rye <laughs> and Angostura bitters. Lord knows I'm going to use that for anything else. Yeah. Apparently you can use it for cooking. Yeah, um, I will help you drink it, by the way. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if folks want to follow along and join you for this ride, if they want to learn more about Diefendorf, where can they go for that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, uh, No site right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I was on a podcast a while ago, and I was trying to imagine spelling Diefen, diefendorfwatches.com to, okay. to listeners. We'll do it's a, not going to work. We'll do a close-up. Yeah, yeah, so we'll watch it, it if you want. So I actually went out and I bought the URL. If you just go to getagreatwatch.com, that will redirect you to our site. Um, and it's set up to redirect you to whatever's the most important thing going on at that moment. So sometimes it'll just be the homepage, sometimes it's for an event, sometimes it's for a blog post. But if you go to get getagreatwatch.com, that'll bring you right to our site. Um, and no matter where it brings you, always just check out our journal, our blog. Uh, that's where we're talking about the latest and greatest. We do have a newsletter, of course, and we support our, our newsletter subscribers as much as we can through sometimes occasional discounts or just um, you know the latest news before it hits the blog um, but that's the best place to go if you want to find out what we're up to and then of course we're on all the social media outlets um, we even have a Google Plus um, really? page uh, how's that going? well I'm still waiting on that one person on Google Plus yeah, to, to, yeah. <laughs> to comment but, but we're on all the social media outlets so you can find us just Diefendorf uh, or Diefendorf watches. So thank you again, James, for coming out and sharing Absolutely. your watches with us. Obviously, guys, expect to see a review of the Diefendorf watch on the channel. These are the production models. I'm hoping to get one or two in hand to talk about on the show. Very excited to share my opinions of these. Um, I don't know if we're going to do a two-part review. We can talk about that later, but do expect a thorough review on the show. As always, guys, thank you for joining me over here on Take Time, and I will catch you on the next Cocktail Time. Cheers. Cheers, guys.